Yeah, I really appreciate being asked to come and speak on my work. It's kind of an interesting forum um, to think about talking about art in. Um, so, no, seriously, it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's like I think the first uh, instance in which I've been asked to speak in a context like this. So I'm curious about seeing where some of the um, kind of relationships come in later on. Um, to be completely honest, it was a little hard to imagine um, maybe exactly where to start this morning um, in light of the, I guess, continual um, news um, and uh, information that's kind of been coming in and feels like it's been coming in full force even before, um, you know, in, even before November and before January. But um, I think without getting too far into it, um, one of the things that now has particularly made me think about um, has been exactly what purpose um, art serves uh, in a society, um, and particularly in one that maybe aims to be holistic. It seems like the goal of this event is to look at like a magnified view. Um, and so I'm grateful actually to know that art is included within that view, um, because it's not, as we've been seeing, it's not important to everyone. So, so I appreciate that. Um, so a little bit of quick background information about me. Um, I was born and raised uh, within the Puerto Rican diaspora in the Bronx, um, and I have been photographing for a number of years uh, at this point, probably about um, almost half my life. Um, and so Initially, the photographs that I was making um, were focused on uh, my community, um, my immediate community, which was the kind of uh, this community, uh, which is underground spaces within the Bronx, um, specifically punk spaces. Uh, we have, uh, for many years and still continuing, there's uh, an incredibly robust um, punk scene in the Bronx that's mostly comprised of like black and Latino kids, uh, which was something that growing up in, it was such a gift to be in that community and feel completely surrounded by that community and a part of that community and not aware of how different maybe it was from other communities that I could have been born into or could have been a part of or could have been felt estranged from um, until I went to college. I went to college at MICA in Baltimore, Maryland. And I remember kind of initially getting there at 18 and looking for my punk scene uh, and thinking and asking around and people being like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, but where's, I was like, okay, this is like, here we are at like, you know, the, the like super bro -y, like masculine white punk scene, but where's, where's, the, where's the other one? And they're like, what other one? Well, there is no other one. And I was like, oh, huh, okay. And then that kind of, experience really started to maybe push on um, or get me to start to think about what I had experienced in those, um, and the, the, the benefit of that. And so I photographed there for a number of years. These are all photographs um, from uh, roughly 2008 to, or actually, sorry, even before that, I think this photograph is from like 2006. Um, and these, a uh, couple of these photographs that I'm showing you are from 2008, 2009. Um, also in the Bronx, um, continuing to kind of photograph within that um, community. Uh, and a number of these relationships um, have continued for years. Um, and so this, this original kind of focus on community and focus on relationships um, has continued throughout my work and become a kind of like ethical standard that, um, that I've held on to. Um, since kind of moving forward. So the body of work, or I'm going to talk about two major bodies of work. Um, and one, uh, and in order to get to those two major body of, bodies of work, we have to go through, the, through the, these kind of two, maybe not minor, but just like smaller amount of photographs on this presentation, bodies of work. Um, so the first one I just took you through, it's the photographs in the Bronx. Um, and then the second one is a, is a uh, body of work called Conversations um, that began in 2010 and finished in 2011. 
Um, and I'm just going to show two photographs from this, but it had a number of, I think it had probably about 25 images total um, in this body of work. Um, and so around af a couple of years after leaving the Bronx uh, uh, and being in college and kind of experiencing um, a, a serious um, expansion of my mind as one does like in college and I teach college now and it's like fantastic to kind of watch that occurring from a distance and remembering and being like I'm so glad I don't have to go through that again um, but um, so after kind of this experience of having that um, happen to me I started to have questions about um, specifically my own gender identity um, my my friends my community um, seemed to be um, and, and in a sense had always been queer, um, but rather people were maybe at that point in time realizing it more or fully coming into, starting to fully come into themselves and fully recognize their own um, queerness or, or the various intersections of their identities and how that was kind of, how that was playing out um, in their lives. Um, and so this, um, this body of work uh, stemmed from a desire to have conversations with the people that I was in community with um, and to photograph them um, in, in ways that felt authentic, emotionally authentic to the experiences that they were going through um, and also to um, really, I mean, honestly, help me kind of maybe think about my own relationship to my own body and my own queerness and my own kind of various intersections of identity, identities. Um, and initially this work was done in the studio um, and so people were coming into this space <clears throat> that is um, like this warm kind of red background and we would have like a long conversation. We would talk maybe for, for an hour, for two hours and then photograph maybe for another hour um, after that, sometimes longer, sometimes less. Um, and these, these photographs were informed um, by previous relationships. So these are people that I, I knew and had, um, had had relationships before. So there was a fair amount of um, of, of connection that pre-existed this moment in the studio. Uh, and so what I started to be curious about, um, particularly in relationship to myself, uh, was about a transgender identity that was um, maybe not as clearly, uh, clearly seen in that moment in time. And it's interesting because I mentioned that I teach college and when I talk to my students now, um, we, we have a very different relationship to um, something like a genderqueer identity. Like they come in and generally, um, a lot of students are familiar with what that is um, or the idea that it could exist. But um, I'm always kind of like, if you imagine back to 2011 and they're like, 2011, <laughs> like, you know. Like, whoa. Um, <laughs> I'm like, it was, I was like, we didn't maybe have the words for that, like, yet. And, and something like genderqueer was something that you more had to um, maybe prove uh, that identity, or even transgender was an identity that people were kind of like, I'm not quite sure. And now um, it does feel like there has been significant progress kind of made on even um, an awareness or an acknowledgement um, that, like, multiple genders exist. I mean, for example, I'm standing here talking to you now. Um, and so that, that feels like uh, it's worth mentioning just to kind of even remember maybe what the context was for this work. Um, and so this is the first major body of work that I'm going to show and it's called Outliers uh, regarding the spaces between genders. Um, and it, it occurred between, um, I was making this work primarily between 2011 and 2014. Um, but to be honest, I don't know that I'll ever finish making this work. Um, because I think it's going to be coming back um, over multiple iterations as I grow. So there's points at which I pull it forward and points at which it kind of pushes back and I work on other things, um, like the second, second body of work that I'll show you. So this story begins in um, two places. Uh, it begins in Tennessee, or two, two moments maybe. It begins, well, one is a physical geographical location and the other is on the internet. Okay, so the geographic location that it begins in is Tennessee. Um, I had never left the East Coast and I had the opportunity to um, work with a photographer um, who was making a body of work that was completely separate um, uh, in rural Tennessee um, on, a, on a queer, 
um, rural kind of farm uh, or sanctuary. It kind of operates as a sanctuary. And never having left the East Coast before, there were a number of things that were fascinating to me. For one, trees um, or meadows. I'm serious. No, <laughs> I'm actually really serious. Now I live in North Adams, Massachusetts, and I'm like, sure, the med like the open space, like okay. But at the time, it was I'd never really imagined that. So there were a number of things that I was kind of understanding, and then one of the moments that that uh, catalyzed this entire body of work was that. I met someone named, um, at the time, Tripp, who, um, who was, uh, who identified as, as gender fluid and also transgender at, at points, depending on what day, and I was so fascinated and, and um, genuinely um, felt like I had found something in um, our conversation about gender and our kind of relationship to each other that seemed to unlock something for myself about how I could possibly see um, myself existing in the future. Um, this person was a number of years older than, maybe about 15 years older than I was, so it also had an element of, of a kind of like queer mentorship, um, even in that moment, like seeing what a future you could look like or that you could even have a future you. Um, the idea that like, yes, like you will, you can age and you can age in a way that feels good in your body. Um, so all of these kind of questions that were circulating were then through this relationship um, started to, to find um, some kind of solution or a path, not even a solution, but just a path toward maybe a resolve. Um, and then the second place that this story begins is on Tumblr. Um, and so Tumblr had been operational, I think, for a couple of years at that point, but one of the things that it, that it was starting to do um, that it's that it's we're seeing kind of I think the effects of now um, in really beautiful ways is that it started to connect communities um, and people who felt that they were isolated. Um, it started to really form a connection point around which um, people could 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 find each other essentially. And so um, I put out a call on Tumblr, um, particularly as just as like an, an offshoot. I had been photographing in my studio and I wanted to see if there was anyone who had an experience that maybe more closely um, matched uh, the experience that I was trying to almost like, it seems, it feels so far away that it seems ridiculous to say, but almost like prove the existence of. Um, and so I, I put this kind of message out on Tumblr and it got reblogged and I got immediately within I think 72 hours, something like 40 responses from across the United States and across, um, and at points like across the globe, which was shocking um, in what it opened up. Like this possibility that like actually, one, you're not uh, making things up. <laughs> Two, other people have had this experience. And three, there might be um, something more to be done here. So this is Trip. Um, and the next kind of following year, so that I met Tripp in uh, the year before this project really started and then um, was lucky enough to um, receive an exit grant from MICA um, that amounted to not, not, um, not a lot of money now, but at the time it was like an incomprehensible amount of money. It was about a $5,000 grant um, with which they like gave me to make this work. Um, and so I then um, proceeded to go back to Tennessee and photograph Trip, um, and also photograph the uh, queer farm that that Trip was living on at the point uh, at that point in time. Um, so this is from a pronoun workshop in which these were kind of staked into the ground and people were working on um, understanding um, different pronouns and where people laid in, respond in uh, relationship to them. Um, it also functions as a safe space, so for a lot of um, people who have um, different genders, there is a, a freedom almost around um, clothing without the fear of being misgendered through um, presentation um, or through like the, bo the, the body that you've been assigned at birth. Um, there you know, is sort of like this freedom to 
um, to be naked or to kind of experience a freedom that one doesn't experience in the world outside of this, this community and this space. Um, and then I started to travel throughout um, the United States. So using those same kind of contacts and uh, connections that were made from Tumblr, um, I was able to connect to people in various cities. Um, I did not have a car at the time, so I did the entire trip by Amtrak, and that was what um, this slide was kind of out of focus. So just to kind of pull back for a second, so I did the entire trip by Amtrak um, with this like huge backpack at the time I was shooting film, um, and so that meant that I was carrying about 150 rolls of film on me at any given moment with a camera that weighed probably about three or four pounds, plus um, everything else that I had to um, use to live, um, and also uh, going from kind of spending about a week in each place. Um, overall, I think I went to about 20 cities, um, and those cities were cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco, and they were also cities like Tuscaloosa, Alabama, um, or, um, uh, let's see, what's the other, or Lincoln, Nebraska, um, places kind of that were accessible by train and by mass transit, but not necessarily um, uh, places that one would maybe hit on a more typical um, kind of list of cities, I guess. I don't know what I'm saying right now. But um, so I stayed with friends, I stayed with people that I met off of the internet, um, which you do things when you're young, you know, you don't have a fear of death. Um, so, but, but, but I felt safe enough. I think it's important to, to mention that I did feel kind of safe enough um, through the, the conversations that were happening, um, through the kind of the extensive communication that was occurring between me and um, other people who I was planning on photographing um, to, to do something like that. Um, so the, um, these two images are in, in, um, in Washington State. Um, this is Ty, I stayed with Ty in Seattle. Um, this is Jill, also in Seattle. Anna Kai in Atlanta. Hannah and Ariel in New Orleans. Marilyn in San Francisco. Addison in North Carolina. Yo-Yo in Los Angeles. And here's another image of Yo-Yo. This is Bambi in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Tuscaloosa was a place that I went on a whim. I had met someone, they had sent me an email, just out of the blue, and I don't think that they expected me to come to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It was kind of the email that you send when you're like, this is really cool, I just want to let you know that. And also, if you ever want to come to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, like, hit me up. You know, it's like you've sent that email. <laughs> like, I've sent that email, and you don't expect anything to happen with that email, you know? <laughs> Um, but I was like, sure, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, sounds great. I'll see you in like three weeks. And he was kind of like, okay, <laughs> sure. And so I went to Tuscaloosa without a plan. No one had contacted me except for this person um, who, who didn't want to participate in the project but was just showing kind of support as an ally. Um, and was, had been, um, uh, after we talked a little bit more, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try and connect you to some people here. Um, but the, the best part of um, going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama was walking into the one gay bar um, and it, it's called the Icon. It's like the best, I think it, it's like my, it's like when I think of like the gay bars in heaven, I'm like, All right, the Icon is going to be like the gay bar in heaven. Um, and, and not in like a, never mind, in the non-denominational heaven. Um, so walk into the Icon and immediately because of its its size as a community, everyone's like, okay, what are you doing here? Who are you? Um, sit down at the bar. Bartender's like, give me your ID. Like, where are you from? And so immediately announces to the bar that I'm from New York. And the entire bar is like, head turns. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I start kind of talking to people about what I'm doing there and, and immediately set up like five shoots for the next uh, kind of three days that I'm supposed to be in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, and Bambi is one of the people that I met that night, um, and I started photographing her um, as she was preparing for um, a drag show that was at the Icon. Um, and then also photographing, um, and then because the community is so small, later I realized that um, another person that I photographed, Riley, who's um, pictured here holding the dollar bill, um, was also 
um, present uh, that night. And later I photographed Riley as well. Um, this is Steph uh, and their partner in New Jersey smoking a cigarette. This is Riley. And Riley's wig. This is Jessica uh, in Washington. And a lot of the conversations that were, were being had focused on kind of maybe the particularities of um, navigating an identity that is not recognized by um, like the state. Um, so, what do you do um, with uh, gender in these specific instances, like on ID cards, or um, when you have to even like identify um, yourself using pronouns, or kind of uh, you know not communicate your identity in a way that that is required of you outside of the systems that have been set up for identity. Um, and so, a lot of kind of our our conversations were happening around that, and also around the shifting kind of the shifting uh, images that one has over the years um, and how that also changes. And around the kind of parameters for who I was photographing, really the only, um, the only thing I was looking for was, a, was actually like an interest in participation. Um, and so I wasn't interested in um, having anyone prove a particular identity to me or having them um, kind of I wasn't interested in, in even fully um, having that be legible to um, the viewer because it's worth mentioning that photography <laughs> as a medium is very bad at telling you, um, you know, the particular shifting details of like a three-dimensional human being that's dynamic and lives in the world. Photography is a fixed image. Um, and so when you talk about something like gender, um, which is, you know, generally pretty fluid and changes over your life, changes as you age, changes as you um, kind of move through the world. Um, introducing something like photography becomes, um, in a word, like it could be kind of viewed as, as uh, problematic, but I think that what I've come to and what I've kind of struggled with, and I've struggled with that over the years about what, what kind of role, what can photography even do? What can a portrait do? Um, particularly as it relates to, um, to people's identities and particularly identities that are shifting or um, understood in different contexts in different ways. Um, and I think that that, um, that for me, photography has been this way to look at a moment in time. Um, and, that's, and that's why when I show these images, I generally just show them with people's names. Um, there was a point, and while I was working, I was, I was using um, these conversations that I was having, and I was recording them with the idea at the moment, sorry, that eventually I would transcribe them. Um, but what I found was that those conversations were maybe more intended for me um, and more intended for, for me to be able to make an, an emotionally authentic portrait to the person, um, but not necessarily necessary to, uh, not necessary to maybe tag or to put on someone for an extended period of time, particularly um, because as I've maintained relationships with many of the people that I photographed, this is Jess in San Francisco, um, and we kind of still have tangential contact with one another. Um, as, do, as I do with many people actually in this, in this body of work. Um, we, people's, people's, things have shifted obviously and um, just as they do over time. And so having that photograph exist of this moment um, divorced from maybe any kind of identifier that's fixed to the image in the way that um, the image is maybe fixed in time, I feel okay with that. I feel okay with letting that information just kind of um, exist for me and float and be the thing that informs my image making, but not, doesn't necessarily um, uh, put a, a fixed narrative on any of the people that I've, that I've photographed. Um, this is Joy in Alabama. And this is another image of Joy um, on the quad of the University of Alabama at like 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> This is Lucky in Compton. 
um, and their tattoo says Lucky, and then underneath it says Brown Boy. And the ring says Dad. So a, another part of my project was that um, it wasn't necessarily just about gender queer identity and its fluidity as a um, concept, but rather also what what how does one form a life or how does one build a life when, when you can't or something prevents you from um, fully achieving the identity that would be most authentic to you. Um, and so a number of people that I photographed did have um, kind of factors uh, that prevented a full achievement of oneself, whether they were economic, whether they were um, actually uh, economic being like the, condi the conditions or actually economic being one's job um, for certain, for a couple of people I photographed who were social workers. <clears throat> um, their genders assigned at birth were actually incredibly important to the populations that they were working with and therefore when they were transitioning or when they were con contemplating transitioning, um, they would have to, if they wanted to fully um, transition toward a particular gender, you would have to, you'd actually have to give up kind of your job. And so for some people that was not a realistic pop possibility. And so there would be this like dual experience of transitioning in one's personal life, but then maintaining a, a um, different identity at, at work as well. And so that was um, also kind of a component that, that revealed itself over time or um, a, a, um, a a parameter or a restriction that was medical. For instance, um, uh, some people cannot take testosterone, some people cannot take estrogen. So there were kind of these other parameters that were maybe um, uh, or, or, or um, affecting how people were able to achieve their identity and then the workaround that one um, that one uses to kind of solve or to re or to resolve, not even to solve, but just to kind of. Um, experience like an emotional, uh, an authenticity in one's life, um, as close to that as you can get. Um, what is your solution? What is, how do you, how do you work it out? Um, how do you stay alive? Um, and this question of resilience um, is one that I'm, I'm kind of a little, I'm running out of time as I always do. Um, I was late to this, you know, it's like, eh, it's okay. Um, but, um, so I won't hold you for much longer. Um, and I'll just show a couple of images from this second body of work. Um, but this question of resilience is also one that I've um, personally um, identified as, as another thing. If, if not, um, uh, if, if identity is one kind of core component of my work that I feel like is going to be kind of unraveling over the course of my life and hopefully the course of um, the art that I make over my life, um, I think resilience is the other. Um, is the other component to that. And so this, this actually starts with, um, so Counter Archive is the, body, is the second body of work. And this body of work um, is, comes after uh, the outliers. I had done a really intense amount of um, emotional work with a lot of people. Ultimately, I think I photographed about 65 people on the first um, on the first trip for outliers, which lasted about for about six months of travel, um, and then there was another round later um, that occurred uh, uh, that was about a month, and then another round um, where I did a specific project in Charlotte, North Carolina, and stayed there for a week and photographed there. Um, and these conversations were exhausting, like. Uh, you know, to be, to be really honest, like in order to do, like my personal ethics as a photographer require me to have a high degree of investment in the people that I'm photographing. I want people to feel safe. I want people to feel like they are um, fully being seen by me and I want them to feel that they have a collaborative um, engagement in the process of image making, particularly as it relates to um, like their identity and the fact that this is going to be an, an image that is going to exist in the world um, and people can see it and people from their lives can see it. So I want people to feel like they have um, a, a, a stake and a, um, a part in the image that's being made of them and I, don't, I do not want it to feel like an exploitative encounter in which one person feels like something is taken from them. And so in order to achieve that, it does take a high amount of like emotional investment and doing that um, again and again, in addition with the traveling, made it like uh, completely exhausting. And I was pretty young at the time, and so um, so I didn't fully have all of the tools that one um, maybe would develop um, over time to manage that. 
Um, so when I came back from that trip, um, I wanted to photograph um, in a way that was maybe staying in one place um, and not moving around every week, not having to relearn the subway system, not having to relearn the bus system, uh, and not kind of putting this like strain on my body, not sleeping on the Amtrak. Um, and so I was on Facebook procrastinating, as one does, and I came across, and I got a friend request from this, um, from like Tank EPW, and I was like, what is that? And I clicked through, and I realized that it's my cousin Alex. <laughs> this is Alex. Um, and over the course of time that Alex and I uh, had, that I had been traveling, Alex became an, um, Alex became an entertainment wrestler, um, an aspiring entertainment wrestler in the Bronx. So. For those uninitiated to entertainment wrestling, a quick rundown, um, it's entirely uh, um, choreographed um, and scripted. Uh, it is um, incredibly acrobatic. One practices every day to be able to, um, to, be able to have the, the skills to perform. Um, it is an incredible, um, really an incredible craft. Um, so when you're seeing people on WWE, um, they are not only um, performers, uh, but they are also, um, or they're not only actors, but they're also incredible athletes as well. Um, and so this is uh, a screenshot from a YouTube video in which you can see me kind of in the, in the uh, center of the image, like right beyond the two um, performers, like photographing. Um, and because it is, and so this is, um, uh, this is actually an inspiration wall that the wrestlers um, have. Uh, on cardboard so that they can move it around so that it can be mobile. Um, so this gives you kind of a sense of what they're aspiring toward. Um, if you're unfamiliar with entertainment wrestling, it's okay, I was too. Um, and so I, I was photographing this entertainment, I was photographing entertainment wrestling and then I also um, at the same time um, was photographing in um, a number of other places as well. I was photographing in the club that I had worked at um, when I lived in Baltimore, uh, Club Hippo, which unfortunately now is closed. Um, I had also been photographing in the, that same room that I showed you initially, um, the, uh, which is the, the, ba the basement of a church in Throg's Neck in the Bronx um, that for about a decade had these punk shows um, that I had attended when I was a teenager and then also later when I was um, an adult kind of searching for or trying to um, like re-energize myself after, the, after doing um, Outliers. I went back to photograph again. Um, and this is also in the basement of that church. This is Kirsten. Um, I think I showed a picture of her in the beginning. Um, and then also at um, Fiesta Patronales in Puerto Rico. Um, this is the most recent development in this project. Um, and so all of these um, separate components uh, kind of in this body of work come together and form um, a, uh, through their sequencing, through just even having them exist all together in one space, um, as a set of images, um, they form kind of like an imaginary community in which um, all identity, all kind of aspects of um, my identity that at points have felt disparate because, right, I was in that church basement and then later I was in a gay bar um, photographing uh, re recently, immigra recently immigrated uh, Latin American drag queens um, for a club night that we had started called Euphoria Latina. Um, and then also like being in Puerto Rico and photographing um, a, essentially a, 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 an annual parade that exists every year in which people costume and dress up and kind of form um, groups that are, that are specifically themed. Um, and thinking about all of those kind of different locations that my identity was occurring in or progressing in, I, I had this, I've, and I think right now where I am as an artist is trying to really kind of bring all of these elements of a fragmented self together. And so this body of work is an attempt to do that. Um, and it does it through, through sequencing. And to avoid going on a tangent, it's gonna be like five minutes longer than I, need, than I should be. I'm just gonna kind of um, mention a couple of things that this work does, but I'm not gonna go too far into them, but I'm happy to talk about them either uh, immediately after this, or if you wanna talk about it one-on-one, -on -one, I'm also happy to do that. Um, I was thinking a lot about the way that photojournalism functions, um, how the black and white functions, um, particularly what a believable image is, um, in what makes an image believable, what makes a, a photojournalistic image versus what makes an image that is um, personal. Um, the fact that these are in black and white is, is not purely um, style. It has to do with 
um, a type of historical image that has been made and then see, seeking to kind of maybe reinsert um, identities that weren't photographed or weren't pictured into that history. Um, I like that many of the photographs could be between uh, 1970 and now. Um, there are things that uh, would tip you off to the fact that this photograph was um, made in 2014, but there are also maybe moment things about it that would um, be able to have it confi be confused with an image that was made much earlier. Also thinking about these spaces, um, the life of these spaces, what happens when they close, what happens when, um, what do they share in common? This vinyl flooring is my favorite kind of flooring because it appears throughout all of the spaces. Um, I think it must be like the cheapest uh, vinyl flooring at, at like Home Depot or something, but because it appears everywhere. Um, it's in the basement, it's in this club. Um, this is also at Club Hippo, which unfortunately is now um, a CVS in, in Baltimore that I recently passed by. Uh, and like very curiously kind of looked in to see if they had covered the floor. Um, my bet is that when it closes and stops being a CVS, like that floor is still there underneath and we could recover it. You know, in the way that like people recover wood floors, I'm like, what about the vinyl? <laughs> Let's recover that vinyl. Uh, this is back in the Bronx at an um, entertainment wrestling show. This is Joe. I um, mean, so this, this, uh, this investment and, and ethics of working with people over time is one that I've held on to. Um, so even as some of these photographs seem incidental, um, there are relationships that have led to their, their production. Um, Joe and I photograph, I've photographed Joe over many times. Um, this is another uh, wrestler who uh, is named Junior, who, we, who I've also photographed a number of times, uh, kind of going back and bringing them photographs back and then kind of, you know, them getting excited by the photographs that they're seeing and then us making a new photograph and collaborating on something else. Um, again, through these spaces, the idea that like, these spaces could be in each other's spaces. Um, so like the, the, the patina of that staircase, um, the floor, uh, the walls, the door frames, um, all of these kind of spaces, though different things happen in them, share a kind of un share a um, a core kind of feeling. And so just to cut in, in kind of conclusion, starting to wrap up, this, um, I think the overarching themes of kind of community, resilience, um, identity, uh, and celebration really come kind of all, hopefully, uh, my goal as an artist is to bring kind of all of those things together um, and to even go back to the first kind of thing that I had, I had mentioned about what what does art do now, right? Like what does, what role does art play now? Um, I think that for me, the role that it plays is one of, um, of giving hope. Um, in a sense, I think it also is one that is very powerful in making um, things possible. Uh, seeing images of oneself, allowing one to um, imagine something beyond or something kind of like on the horizon, um, something that you have not yet um, been able to achieve, but seeing it um, represented in an image gives you, I think could give one, or I hope it does give one um, kind of the, the impetus to, to keep going, um, really. So that is, that's, um, that's what I think art can do um, today. So thank you. I'm from Hello. Compton, and so I was, I'm like, I never see stuff from Compton. Uh, so how did you, yeah. meet that person um, and do you remain in yeah. contact with any of the, the subjects that you photograph? Yeah, um, I, 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 am in, I am in contact with, I'd say, I don't know, I couldn't tell you how ma exactly how many off the top of my head because I'm trying to count them right now and I'm like, uh, maybe, but a lot, a lot of people, Lucky and I are still in contact. Um, 
You know, I think the, the initial that it happened kind of through the internet made it very easy um, to actually remain in contact with people. And, and I'm thankful for that because the work of like, um, of the, the networks that brought us together actually helped to kind of keep us, keep us together. Um, and so, how did I meet Lucky exactly? I think that the way that I met Lucky, okay, I remember. Um, the way that I met Lucky, uh, it was actually a multi-pronged approach. So it started on Tumblr, and then what I started to do was research out um, specific local organizers and then come to them with images and come to them with the project and then ask them if they were comfortable to send it out to their networks to see if anyone wanted to participate. And then through that, um, so the Brown Boy Network in, in LA, um, there's one particular organizer, Isaac Perez, who I talked to um, and sent Isaac, the, the profile of what I was doing, Isaac sent it out and I got an email back from Lucky and then we met up, um, we met up um, pretty shortly thereafter, maybe a couple days thereafter. And then Lucky and I have stayed in contact um, uh, on, on social media, um, really, uh, as I have with like a number of people. And there have been people I've been able to see again, um, but, and photograph again. Um, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen Lucky, but I do feel like we're, we're, we're still kind of um, keeping tabs on each other in a way. Um, and we've kind of had some conversations. They've, um, and just even like, I don't know, and not at past them, but just seeing kind of how people's lives have grown or how people's lives have like shifted um, since kind of the project uh, and since the initial photographing of it. Um, yeah, so the contact is very, the continued contact is like very important kind of to me. Um, and sometimes it can't happen though. That's the other thing. So there, there were a couple of people who I did talk to um, and, and in particular, there was, there's one woman, one older woman in particular that I talked to who I photographed, who I spent a day with. And then um, when I sent her the photographs later, her, her email had changed. So I got a bounce back from it. So our mode of, our method of finding each other was kind of cut off. And so she had, she had just emailed me. There wasn't kind of a social media presence because um, it, there was, um, I alluded to it a little bit, but the um, fear of, um, of, of someone, there was an acknowledgement of the risk of someone seeing the photograph that was being made, but then also an acceptance of that and through our communication and through our kind of conversation over the course of the day that we spent together. And then um, when I went to kind of send the photograph back uh, a couple months later after I had returned home and processed the film and like worked all the shifts at, at um, Starbucks to be able to process the film. Like it was kind of like a, a process, but um, that, that communication got cut off. So when I can, like I, I maintain that contact, but sometimes I can't, so yeah. Um. Um, so in, in our work, we have to make sort of similar decisions about where to focus. Mm. So it seems like there's something I really liked about all the images, and then I don't want to put my interpretation of the images on to. But it seems like the um, it seems like your focus, like you mentioned, is on resilience. Like everybody's mm -hmm, got an inner mm -hmm, element, whether mm -hmm, it's the entertainment mm -hmm, wrestling mm -hmm, or you know mm -hmm. the group of people that you had photographed. They were on farm, or they really mm -hmm, mm -hmm, were mm -hmm. performing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sort of the focus is in this uh, resilience mm -hmm. side. But there's sort of this implicit kind of counter narrative along with that that says when these you know kids aren't in the basement mm -hmm. of the church and they're walking around the Bronx, what is that? Yeah. How are they approaching their identity differently than when they're in their own land? Yeah. And so I just kind of wanted to get a sense of how you decided to focus on this side of that story as opposed to the counter, the other side. Yeah, I think for me. Um, yeah, that that for me that I'm so glad to to hear that because that that um, is in a sense I'm like ah oh, yeah they're working okay cool <laughs> great uh, I think that that focus had comes from like a, a reaction um, against maybe what was a more dominant narrative of um, of struggle um, a lot of images and and historically <laughs> images of the Bronx. Um, there have been photographers who have made images in the Bronx for a long time of their own communities. At the same time, there has been also like a history of images where um, these images have shown one view 
of not just the Bronx, but any of these communities. And that, and that kind of has been um, or an outsider view, an outsider view for the most part. Um, and so I think that what I initially um, was doing intuitively and then have, have then refined um, has been showing maybe a view that is not a dominant view, um, but is maybe, and that's kind of like where this idea of the counter comes in to kind of like bring something that is um, not typically seen and, and feels um, good because of, of that, like feels good to um, the audience. So I guess the audience that my work really seeks to, um, to serve um, is the audience in the photographs. Um, and so they're always kind of like the first audience for me. Um, and, and when I think about who my work is for, I think about my work as being for like queer people of color who have diasporic, um, histories and so that kind of informs you know a, a lot of I think where I focus um, and what kind of what shape my authorship takes um, I think also um, you know and but at the same time like anyone can come to a photograph and part of it is part of experiencing art is bringing like yourself to a piece and and regardless of what your identities are but i think that there's there's for me like there is a pri there is a primary audience but then i'm happy to have that work be experienced by as many audiences as possible um, as well <laughs>